Hello and welcome back to the channel. Thank you for joining me in another of my wonderful interviews. Today I'm talking to a man who wants to help people who are working, people who have been perhaps frightened because of legislation that's come in in recent times. We all remember three years ago when there was a, a rather terrible event which then subsequently meant that many people were forced into having a, a medical um, implementation that they didn't necessarily want. It impacted on their jobs, they were a bit nervous about it. And so my guest today, Dr. Warren Lee, who is also an ordained priest, uh, set up a union to work with such people. And he joins me now to tell me about how this process came about, how they've been um, using employment legislation to support workers. Uh, hello to you, Dr. Warren. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Richard. I hope that that, as a garbled introduction, sort of set the scene for who you are and what you do. But I'm sure you're, of course, much more qualified to tell us that. First of all, just interested that you're orda ordained as a priest. So that's uh, fascinating. You, you've obviously got the calling to help people. Yes, and it was a, a calling inside. So when we started three years ago, I couldn't resist that. Uh, I'm motivated by that pressure inside uh, because I know the benefits of helping people. At the end, uh, it helps everybody. And the, the second commandment of Jesus is basically uh, to love thy brother. Um, and that's the way by networking. That's what we are doing, networking to resolve the, the problem for people. And it comes back to us at the end. So there we were three years ago and um, or, or I suppose two years ago when the beginning of this uh, medical intervention was given and people were under pressure. Um, and is that sort of the, the key part of what you were when you were getting involved with the helping through legislation to protect their their um, rights yes um i didn't want to do this i mean i didn't know how to do this i, I was here to develop two things my engineering teaching online my lecturing at universities uh and my church so those are the two things but an event happened where i had to diversify and stop doing what i was doing more or less and realizing where the fear is. I could see fear on people's faces. And most of those people who were affected were people in employment and even students. You know, their careers were now being affected uh, by overzealous management attitudes, um, instigation, instigation, implementation of company policy, which is based on guidance and recommendations and not legislation. And really, these people were a diverse group of people, doctors, nurses, care workers, teachers who love their job. And that's all they want to do is love their job and help the people what they're supposed to be doing. They don't know about employment law. And this is where the fear was. And, uh, and this is where I started to resolve that uh, fear, remove it. I mean, I certainly remember the time, and of course it was all on the news and everything, when um, certain workers were basically being threatened, if you don't have this medical in, in, intervention, you will lose your job. And of course, subsequent, we discovered that this thing actually didn't do what it said on the tin uh, by any means. And so p many people have presumably lost their jobs out of fear and resigned, didn't want it, uh, only to realise that actually... They, they needn't have done that, and, and they were effectively pushed out by an overzealous government. Yes, uh, uh, um, I recognise what you say there, Richard. Um, I remember one call was, well, two calls very similar from uh, 19 teenage ladies, mothers, single mothers, and one was a care worker, and they're on £9.95 an hour. It's not a fortune, but they love their job. They say, we love our job, we love working with people, but one particular lady, sorry, two 19-year-olds, they're both single mothers, one of them said to me, I can't help it. It's spin my head is spinning in the morning, in the night time. It I don't know what to do. This is my job and I need, or they tell me I need to have a medical intervention. And she's crying. I mean, the amount of people come on the phone crying. Mm. And I would spend all day, seven days a week, or if you're in Liverpool, eight days a week, uh, try, uh, <laughs> you know that record. Um <laughs> So trying to help people understand what can be done. And I realized then it's an education, it's an education process, as well as being an oasis of legal help for them. 
And to step back a bit, um, I can step back a few months before there, how, how I started, if you wish. Yes, please. Um, so I heard a lot of parents were concerned about the imposition of face masks on their children. And they wrote good letters, um, but they were getting no responses and there was uh, nothing they thought that could be done about this. And this is where I, I started with a test case in the North Wales area. So I wrote to 24 care homes and I wrote to 15 schools. And I did this um, by setting up the Workers of Wales Union and the Workers of Scotland Union, which became part of the Workers of England Union with the kind support of Stephen Morris, who is the General Secretary, the Workers of England Union. So this letter uh, wasn't just any letter. Uh, there's certain rules that were told to me by solicitors um, that there should be no emotions in there, no storytelling. It's got to be stone cold, ice cold legislation, what they're breaching. So that's a letter I wrote. This was checked by our solicitor. And uh, consequently, that went out. And the response I got here was very positive. And by doing this uh, and doing Zoom meetings to help people, certain people were attracted to this type of movement, this positive attitude. So eventually we spread this letter to the whole of the UK and 48 mainly ladies set up coordination groups around the UK. And if they're watching this, they know, they know who they are. All around Scotland, we did Scotland first. Um, 10,500 letters were produced. They raised over £15,000 to produce to post these letters recorded delivery to wow. all the heads of the schools. And then it started. It was an avalanche of mail coming through my letterbox, emails, phone calls. And it wasn't just to me. It was also to Stephen of the Workers of England uh, Union. Uh, me being here in North Wales in Clandidno, Workers of Wales. We had an, a rep we set up in Scotland, in near Glasgow. So it, we were inundated with phone calls, inquiries from the heads. Some were... Uh, easy to work with, basically. What do we do then? What would you like us to do? Mm. And the answer basically is respect the legislation, the health and safety legislation. Know what you're doing. Be informed before you do it, before you try and impose, impose a medical intervention on children because it could it could harm people. And then you're because you're responsible as a head teacher, you are liable personally under section under the 1974 uh, uh, Health and Safety Act and the 1999 Management of Health and Safety. And they don't know these things, and the teachers don't know, and the heads don't know, and the governors don't know. That's, that, that I mean, do. it's incredible, isn't it, that they don't know that they are personally liable for this sort of thing, which could be devastating to them if things go wrong. Well, it is. The, the health and safety laws are very good laws. They've been replicated uh, in many countries, Commonwealth countries mainly. And... Um, the 1974 Health and Safety at Work Act, Section 234, is uh, the liability on the employers. The Section 7 is on the is personal. So really, you could be theoretically charged for manslaughter if you don't know what the medical intervention could do to that mm. person. You need to know what you're applying. If you're a nurse, you need to know what you're giving that client patient. If you damage them, they, you can be held responsible. Besides the corporation who you work for, is also responsible. Yes, and 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 yet they still and yet they didn't know. So what was the response then when you when you got these letters and and you were saying to them this is what you should do? Did they listen? Some told me where to go, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, the, the 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 I suppose the the mantra here is. Um, you can use no emotion. You have to train your, your brain to be no emotions. The what you say, you just say, well, why can't you comply with this legislation? Mm. What legislation? Well, it, it's this. And um, and if you're actually trying to intimidate people at work, um, your employees, that could be a breach under Section 241 of the Trade Union Act 1992. Oh, well, yes, OM means it also carries, a, it's a criminal offence. And also, if you don't, when they're imposing on students, on workers, employees, these medical interventions, they have to do a risk assessment. You know, if an employee actually waves the flag, please do a risk assessment. They have to comply. Why? Because the 1999 Management Health and Safety says they have to do one. Oh, right. The implication there is if you don't do one, 
it's a criminal offence. So, now, so were people asking them, saying, right, OK, look, we, we would like a risk assessment to this? Yes, uh, they were being ignored, but the managers, uh, they have to know these legislation. They have to know if they're going to impose any, like a face mask. Uh, there could be different materials of a face mask. So if there's any physical, mental, emotional damage to them, to that medical intervention, you know, they could be, they are liable because they're responsible. And, and this works in our favour because m my uh, attitude, my philosophy, if you wish, is to win without going to court. Right. Win means what are your objectives as an employee? You don't want to do this. You, you, there's no reason why you should. You're not hurting anybody. You want to get on with your job. But we need to find a way without going to court or tribunal. Uh, and that's the magic of this, is understanding um, not just the knowledge. Yes. Because the knowledge replaces the fear. Uh, and once you can give the employees who came on our Zoom meetings every Monday and Tuesday, and we did a lot of Zoom meetings for two or three hours, we had reps on there, we had David Curtin on there, we had paralegals, uh, solicitors on there, union reps giving legal and employment advice. It, this really helped. Uh, to, to, and it's that knowledge that gets rid of the fear. But then the next question would be, what do we do with that knowledge? Hmm. It, knowledge is no use unless you have a, a strategy. And that's what I like, is to find a, a strategy, a solution for everybody, if you wish. And I guess it changes to, depending on each institution that you're working with, although there must be some sort of similarities. Yes, you, you, you get to... You, but when somebody comes on the phone to me and say, I've got a problem at work, I have a set, set of questions that once I've got the answers to, I know what their position is. Yes. And I know how to help them, what legislation we can use um, and how, what strategy can we use? Now, with somebody you know we've been talking about just before we came on here, um, she's a teacher. Uh, I, I've got teachers IT workers at the moment. And the idea is they feel intimidated even now by certain impositions of policy, which are not above legislation, by the way. And this is, an, this is endemic at the moment. Uh, a policy controls everything that they're ignorant of the legislation. But the, to change people's attitudes, they, they're still in fear. You have to turn it around so they don't feel intimidated, so they have some control of the situation. And, and there is a, a way you can do this within, if I can give you an example. Mm. We have a rather large university, one of a very small handful where political university, you can probably know the one I mean. We have an IT worker there. Um, he asked a very simple question. He said, my colleagues are working from home some of the time. My wife's a nurse. We've got two kids. One has a problem. Can I work from home some of the time and work in the office? They said, no, this is a year ago. He asked them again, and they became hostile to him. I, I mean, really, from his right. testimony to me. So how do you turn, he felt intimidated every time they approached him. How do you turn that situation around? Well, you can. And four weeks later, he came on the phone to me and I, I spoke to him on a regular basis. I, I told him the strategy, what we can do, what he can do. And he came on the phone four weeks later. He said, you know, um, they are now nervous of talking to me. They come in and they back off. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Well, he said, I feel better for it. Yes. I, I really do. I can carry on with my work. And you can take it further. So there are techniques you can apply without breaching any, any legislation, actually using legislation, preparing evidence for yourself and uh, get into a different mindset. You can only do that once you've got certain knowledge. And that's why on our website, harmonyunion.org, there's a page called Legal Cafe. And many people will know Legal Cafe. Um, we've had lots of Zoom meetings. The idea is that is to supply education. I'm, going to, I'm just going to show your, um, just bear with me whilst I bring it up on the screen here, uh, your oh, thank you. website, so people can just get a, a, a rough idea. Hang on, let's go to the top. Now, here we go. that photograph there, if I can just mention, was the uh, King of Ghana. And uh, he has a church for 26 years, and um, he gave us a civility award for helping people, our small team. Uh, and the Civility Award was also for the, the, the legal cafe, which I represent, the workers of Wales and the workers of England. Now, we're there at Manchester Town Hall with the Lord Mayor. 
So that certificate was was given to us uh, last last September, and there's a small team of people who did all this work. That's fantastic. And you, there's a law there in Manchester. You and and the cafe and just to try to see if I can find the link to your. Yeah, if you go to the uh, menu at the top navigation oh, bar, yes, here we go. the last page will be there. A legal cafe. Legal cafe. Yeah. So may I explain the difference between a union and a legal cafe? Mm, please do. Yes. Simplicity. Um, a union's there to represent employment legislation, the employee, not to provide education. I know some unions will provide accident and sickness insurance and pensions and all this, but quite simply, it's there to represent you people in employment matters like grievance meetings, disciplinary meetings or investigation meetings. It doesn't educate as far as I know what, I've, what I know all, for all these three years. So Legal Cafe was set up from our experience using employment law for three years on our Zoom meetings, going to disciplinary meetings to provide the education the employee needs. Now, the employee doesn't need um, a PhD in law. You know, you just need a top level. And then you need um, a group of people behind you that you can come back to and say, oh, well, is that right? I'm doing this right. And then you need a Zoom meeting. And that energy, that positive energy, they change. Mm. Uh, let me give you three examples. We have a teacher in a private school down in the south of England a few years ago, wear a face mask or go and here's five thousand pounds to encourage you to go. Really? Oh this this is a magic number, five thousand pounds. There's a sort and of a buyout to get rid of you because you're just a bit of a troublemaker because you won't go along with their policy. Correct. That, that's that what it appears to be. Hmm. And um, she said no and she came to me at the Workers of Wales Union over three months uh, we established a strategy and eventually um, the school, the private school, got a company of lawyers onto us. But eventually they paid out uh, £25,000. Plus what's more important sometimes is people in the middle of their career, they need a, a good reference. Mm. You, you know, you, after 12 years, you can't go somewhere. Where have you been for 12 years? Well, yeah. I, I can't tell you. You know, can't tell you because they pushed me out. Yeah. And they won't the give me a reference. Teacher, yeah, you need a reference uh, besides the compensation. Same with the second teacher in Stoke and Trent, a young lady. Uh, and she was brilliant to work. All these teachers are brilliant to work with because they know how to learn and then think about it and use it. Uh, there's a lady in Stoke and Trent, 31 years old. Again, the magic £5,000. And we got her within a few months, £13,500. She'd been there only a few years. Um, but, but it's not about money it's about the, the once they realize they have human rights and legal rights employment rights it's about they, they can stand up for themselves they can yes. walk tall without fear in, in their vicinity when somebody goes through something like that and if they want to keep their job it must be quite hard if the if the employer has been pretty hard against them and they've defended their right, say, not to wear a mask in certain situations or whatever. The the will, surely, to keep working for a company that is treating you reprehensively it must be uh, must be quite difficult because you because you know you know that they're not really they're not really looking after you. They're not on your side, yeah. even though you've you've got this nice job. That I mean, it must be difficult for people to make that call to say, well, I still want to work here even though their policies are just draconian. Yes, because you're faced with choices. And um, when it gets a situation where they think you're speaking against the narrative and that's their policy, mm. uh, you've got three or four choices. The first one is you either comply and, you know, it, it could be a mad directive, what they're trying to give you. You comply or you walk. You walk without any money uh, and you may have been there 10 years, 31 years in some cases that we know of. Or the only other thing is, if you do walk, you've got no compensation. You, you, got, you don't have a good reference. So you need a reference. So you mm. stay and fight. You stay and fight because you've got no choice. Now, there's a technique of fighting. And you never go on the defensive. You go on the offensive. And there's a dividing line between policy and legislation that you need to recognise. They will be using their policy to pull you in. You will be using 
once you realize, once you know about it, once you get the education and you've got the right people representing you, uh, and we do have the right people, you will be walking on the legislation side because they can't argue. They argue that their policy controls everything. Well, ACAS, and people can write this word down, ACAS will say that their policy at minimum should reflect uh, the appropriate legislation. It should be an honest and fair uh, conduct in any any meetings and it should meet ACAS protocol, not their protocol. Yes. So what happens is, um, how do you turn that situation around? Sometimes you can't because they, they want you out. Right. And they will ignore legislation and they will face the consequences when it goes to tribunal. But in the meantime, you can turn it around. Um, and the key word here is evidence. Any solicitor would ask you, um, do you have evidence to support your case? So this is a major part in our education. What evidence? How do you get this paid for? If you're going to go to employment tribunal, it can cost you £60,000 in legal fees. I know one guy, I won't say his name, spent four years of his own money and own time. He won in the end. It cost him £64,000. Wow. To win. And he carried on being employed. Um, but we don't want to get there. We don't want to get to employment tribunal. We want to have... This is a, this is a, the technique, and I don't, I'm not too sure. I won't ex ex reveal all the techniques on here. But basically, with the right evidence, you can make you can put incremental incremental pressure um, to influence uh, if it's a school, the the governors or the head teachers, and to 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 achieve your objectives. It's the same in the care home. Uh, I've had when when they realise we have evi certain evidence and certain legislation that could be used against the manager. I've had the manager from a major city council gets up from the meeting and never come back because he's, he's, he, he is scared. Yes. Suddenly realised that the cards were against him. Yes. And they don't realise. I, I, what I try to do is a compassionate approach, but I, I don't, I haven't come across anybody with the compassion to find an amicable solution uh, when they start to implement their policy uh, against somebody else because the employee takes it home seven days a week, 24-7. It's in their mind. Mm. These people on the management side walk home after five o'clock. They've ticked all the boxes and they think, oh, I've done a good job. You know, this is how they're programmed. This is the way the ego comes into it and not the divinity side where they should be helping people. No, they, they go all guns blazing to, to get people, which is a, a terrible shame on themselves. So do you think... Um... I mean, I'm fascinated here between the, the sort of the concept of the policy a company will have, whether mm. that's, you know, you've got to wear a mask or you've got to wear a certain uniform or, you know, these are the set hours and you can only do this and you can only do that against what is legislation. Is there a lot of ignorance, do you think, that companies who set up their businesses, they they sort of invent their policy to suit their needs as a business, clearly, but they may not have even considered what the legislation is, what the rights of these those people who are going to work for them. Is there is there ignorance or are they in many cases just deliberately trying to get away with the what they can for the greater profit? Or is it a bit of both? It's a mixture of all those. Yeah. Sometimes total ignorance. I can see it on the faces. Um, one of the the ACAS is a good reference um, website to go to. There's a protocol to show that there's a fair and honest meeting going on. And when I ask at the beginning of the meeting, uh, are we conducting this meeting under ACAS protocol? Yes, yes, they'll say. Or if there's no answer, I can see it on their faces. What do you mean? Yeah, they haven't a clue. They haven't got a clue. And that's good evidence. Yes. If they say yes, I can use that to pull them back. If they say no, then I can question them to say, well, what fair and honest policy framework are you using? Because ACAS actually say, whatever system you're going to be using, it has to meet their standards at minimum. Mm. Now, the protocol, sorry, the policy, um, this situation we have at the university, by the way, I mean, it mentioned a little while ago, um, they won't let me, they, okay, they, um, I can, they were using pro policy above legislation. Uh, when I questioned them uh, on certain legislation, inc included the Human Rights Act on representation, they said, no, that's our policy. We don't do that. 
Now, I'm speaking in this particular case to a barrister of the university and a professor of law. Right. And that person turned around and says, no. I said, well, how can you say that? This is legislation. Our policy. Our po- as if that's, that trumps everything else. That, yes. I mean, that's unbelievable, especially as he's a barrister himself and should know the difference. Yes, exactly. So after this meeting, I, I mean, I, I won a victory after a few months later, but <laughs> after that meeting, I bounced this off a barrister friend who won, uh, won a, a breach of the um, 2010 Equality Act last June. And um, uh, and this, this barrister said, exactly, we, we are facing this in barrister level all the time with companies. They are not respecting legislation. They're using their policy, thinking that they are uh, impervious to any litigation because they use a policy. Hmm. And they train their staff. The human, human rights, the human resources actually teach their staff, possibly coercion techniques, psychological techniques, but no employment law. And these individuals in their human in, in their human resources could be personally liable. Yes, and and not aware. No, and this is this is how I can use this knowledge, legislation, to a- achieve objectives because I can turn it around against them. Let me give you a, an example. Hmm. Um, they come on and they're defending themselves behind their policy, but first of all, you say, well. Did you do a risk assessment? My client here has got evidence to say you've done no risk assessment. Is that correct? They say, yes, it's correct. Um, in that case, um, are you insured? Does you, do you have public liability insurance because your insurance um, has certain conditions that you have to, you are constrained by certain requirements, i.e. a risk assessment. If you drive a car, your premium is based on the risk. And an insurance company, if you phone them, and I, we have done this over the last three years, they will say, Without a risk, we can't give you a premium. We can't insure you. Right. So the implications here go even further now. I'll tell you. Because they can't insure you, I will say to the manager, in that case, uh, if you haven't done a risk assessment, uh, you can't get insurance. So my client would be happy to consider um, a, a personal indemnity that you could indemnify them for any problems, medical, emotional, physical, that happens to them due to your medical intervention policy. Are you willing to accept that? Because we would like either a letter from your insurance, not the certificate, a letter from the insurance to say, we are insuring these people. If you can't get one, I want a letter from your solicitor to say you will indemnify my client. And so that's when it begins to, they begin to feel it, they become personally liable. Yes. And to go one step further, when they get up from the meeting, is when I say, by the way, 1999 Management Health and Safety has a criminal element to it. If you haven't got a risk assessment, potentially there's a criminal conviction. Now, Mr. Manager, I'm saying to you, if you don't, if you carry on the way you're carrying on with my client and it goes down that way, I don't know if you get a criminal conviction or even inquiry as a criminal potential conviction. If you can continue working with children ever again. In fact, how old are you? 40 years old? In the middle of your career, maybe you'll never work with children again. Mm. Your career is over. They must rue the day that you walk through the door. <laughs> if, if I, you know, if they're behaving uh, the way that you, you, you say, or they're or in ignorance or by design or believing their policy is the only thing and it's above the law and they can treat people the way they're treating them and intimidate and fear them and force them to take things they don't want to. And then uh, a saintly figure like yourself, ordained as well, comes in and says, look, hang on a minute. I'm just pointing to the legislation. I'm just asking you sensible, intelligent questions that you should know. And there's standing there or sitting there with their mouths open thinking oh we haven't done any of this uh, on the other on the other hand what you just mentioned there they they may refuse to answer or um they will never give you the opportunity to question them you, you do get people like this right so there's a technique of making them realize how serious it is i will say then uh, i'm i'm stopping this meeting because uh, I'm considering stopping this meeting because there's no meaningful discussion taking place. And therefore, I will report this back to ACAS and this will be used as evidence against you. 
So they don't want to engage in a meaningful discussion. They want to dismiss everything, not listen to yes. the other side. So there's techniques where you don't have to go to court to win your objectives. So at that scenario where they realize they're liable, they'll say, well, what do you want? I say, well, it's not what I want. I want you to comply with the legislation. Um, this this is the client here. They have an objective. They want to continue working in a safe environment. Mm. Can you please comply with the legislation? What's your answer? And then if they, if they get awkward or I can't m- maneuver them, then I'll, I'll put the policeman act on. I will say, right, um, because in the beginning, what they would do, use are certain psychologically prepared techniques to scare, to put fear into the worker to have a medical intervention they don't want. After 10 minutes of receiving uh, a diatribe of fear put into them about their career, s- some of these people will break down yes. and do whatever they want. So um, I used to re- I realized after the third experience of this, how we can combat that. And uh, we can turn that around and basically stop it. Stop putting fear into the client. And because of the the harassment legislation, intimidation legislation, evidence, I will turn around to that person when I get into the meeting, I'll say to them, um, the pros, I'll say, look, uh, we are using ACAS protocol. Are we? Yes, we are. Okay. Um, my client has evidence which I'll, I can reveal to you in a little while. However, I believe on the desk in front of you, you have a script that you're going to say to my client. And they say, well, how do you know? I said, because I've done this hundreds of times. I know what you're going to say. And let me give you a warning now. If you harass my client in front of me, I, I'm, I'm a witness, i evidence that I can use this as harassment. If you're going to intimidate them, if my client says they feel intimidated by what you're saying to them and harassing them, this is also potentially a criminal offence. So anything you say now, I will take down, I will use an evidence against you in a tribunal. Am I making it clear? And I will then say to them, if you wish, we can adjourn this meeting for a few minutes while you take legal advice and then come back and continue. But I warn you, if you continue with the script you're going to use now, um, uh, my client, if he tells me he's being harassed or she, uh, we have to stop the meeting and we look at harassment, breaches of harassment law, 2010 Equality Act. Do I make myself clear? And by that time, they're either shaking or they get up and go or they comply. They don't do that script. Yes. Okay. Very, wise, very wise of them not to. Yes. I'm not using any opinions, Richard, here. Mm. Yeah, I've heard that none opinions being used here. I'm just using legislation. I'm not yes. being nasty. It's a, it's a very difficult battle with some managers. They're full of them ego. They're full of themselves. And you have to break that down to try and... Amicably, uh, amicably resolve this uh, situation. And and what would you say um, percentage, what sort of percentage wise? I mean, obviously not after exact figures, but on the whole, are you able to um, get through to these people and and show them where they have made the mistakes, where policy seems to have um, trumped what should be, of course, legislation being the the trump card. I would say 50-50. I've had many people come on the phone years later. Um, we, ha- we have, uh, and they said, care workers, nurses, doctors, dentists, in fact, uh, holistic dentist that um, I use in Huddersfield, um, doctors, you know, GPs who come on the phone and said, our legal cafe, our workers of Wales, our education meetings, our representation have really helped them because their union was not representing them with this medical intervention policy. Mm. No union was helping people. So I say about 50-50. Many people have left. They can't take the pressure. They've gone to other other jobs. Um, a great one, she was speaking uh, yesterday with Peter. Uh, she's a teacher, 20 years teacher, great experience with kids. Bec- we kept her employed without going into the school for two and a half years. And she only worked 47, 37 days on full pay. Gosh. Because once they realise legislation can work against them, mm. they, they have to back off and they have to be careful what they do. Uh, and that's going to tribunal at the moment. Um, so it, it does work. And um, also people find other opportunities. Um, when they're pushed out, another, another door opens. That's the, way, that's the way God works. By the grace of God, this is what I've been doing and it works. I know it works. Mm. You know, it gives me 
not happiness. Uh, happiness is a materialistic thing. It's joy, which is a spiritual thing. I get joy when I can help people because I know they will help other people. Can I ask you about um, the teachers that are teaching uh, a curriculum now uh, for children that is over-sexualized? And I've interviewed the ladies who have taken uh, the Welsh um, government to court, and uh, I think it's child public child protection Wales. Yeah. And part of the problem, it seems, from the um, from the mothers and parents of the of the children who are being taught this, that the teachers themselves are either being harassed to teach inappropriate material to children or they're not even aware that this is inappropriate for the age group that they're teaching. Do you, do, have you got involved with any of those sort of cases? I, I don't go too deep. I look um, where the breaches of legislation are. Now, these people um, who set up in Wales, I know them personally right from the beginning. Uh, in Blanafistiniog, they come here in Cladidna on the beach. I, I know and there's one living in Rill. And, you know, they have a, a, and they are, knowledgeable people and they are concerned like many parents about this and they realize that by undermining our cultural values which are based on spiritual values mm. a lot of manipulation for the wrong reasons can happen and you know stability in our society integrity of our society requires a strong spiritual element not a materialistic element you know i've got this i've got that uh, that's the dark side um these ladies, all they're trying to do is preserve um, preserve a goodness, if you wish, in, in transferring knowledge by educational methods. Uh, I don't go into these subjects too deeply. All I'm looking for, because if I stay squeaky clean using employment legislation, I can represent them yes. where there are breaches. Because I won't, you see, once you start going into opinions, and this is what this, this is, they said that um, this medic, uh, there's a medical research letter information here. They'll present an opposite one. So if you present something on one subject, they'll come back and present uh, the opposite view. OK, so you can't win a discussion like that. And I'm not out to win a discussion like that. I'm out to just say, please comply with legislation because legislation is well thought out um, over the years. It should mm. be well thought out. If the legislation is, if the legislation, though, is against um the individual or the worker um I, and i don't know how that works with the curriculum if the curriculum is being you know it's a government um endorsed uh, piece of i guess it's legislation you know that you must teach this this is the requirement that the government requires of state schools and and then if that is legislation but morally it's not right how do you play then if the if if you're as you say just <clears throat> dealing with the legislation but there's a a moral a moral issue um in the example of teaching kids things that perhaps are age inappropriate how, how do you deal with that i mean people like christopher hitchens and they would be ideal on this and um what i look for is a breach of legislation for example um I mentioned the Health and Safety Act 1974. Now, section two, three, and four and, and seven, there's the corporate and the personal. If there's any medical, this is where it needs to be argued out sometimes, mm. is it any medical, physical, emotional damage that's gonna to happen to the children or could potentially happen to the children by teaching the wrong things, you know? Yes. Then there could be a litigation case. There could be a breach of the Health and Safety Act. Now, if you don't want to, there's techniques of um, achieving certain things without paying for this. So people think the word sue, oh, we'll go and sue them. That's a lot of money. Mm. Have you got the money? You may lose, and then they have to, you have to pay them. So there are techniques, what I, I use, to bring in legal powers, uh, which, which doesn't cost anything, which can force them to do things. So we would examine that based on health and safety regulations based on 2010 Equality Act. You know, there's harassment in there. There's intimidation uh, also. You can be intimidated. 
I, mean, I don't mean just for the teachers. Mm. Um, and some of these teachers don't know. And the reason why they don't know is because um, I remember when tick box mentality came in uh, back in the 1970s, they called it the personnel department and that changed to HR. And everything, well, everything was, if you tick these boxes and you can go home at five o'clock and that's it, your ego is happy. You know, you tick the boxes and that's what they're doing. They're implementing a tick box approach without thinking about it. You know, I, I was taught... Um, to think about it, contemplate on it, meditate on it, and then try and resolve the issue. Mm. Uh, I, I can I just mention here that I, I worked at Red Bull Formula One about 10 years ago, and you can't work there if you're negative. You go in there one day, say, guys, we ain't going to win the race. You haven't got a job. You've got to go in there as a team and say, how are we going to win this race? Even though you don't win, but you might win, mm. but we have to have a way to win. So it's got to be a thinking process and if it's a tick box mentality you're not using you're not using this no and you need to be spiritually connected you know are you going to be damaging these people these young ch children this is what the, these groups are concerned about is the content right i mean i could speak more deeply about the spiritual reasons for what is happening but on here i don't think i should i think i'm just speaking about legislation Sure. And that's it. If you don't connect what's going on in the world with a spiritual connection, you won't have the answer. You'll still be enjoying conspiracy theories, you know, and that's what people do. They're trying to understand the chaos in this world. Why is it happening? What can we do about it? What we can do about it is be a light for other people and help people and network. We, we can do that. And um, before I go, I want to mention, I'm not, you, you tell us when we, we should go, but there are techniques on how you can um, not just do firefighting for individuals, but how you can affect the 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 local community. With um, if you'd like to have a look at the one, I'll let you know. It's, a, it's a, an association. It's called the Landunno Community Care Association, and and the reason I'm saying this to you, if you go into the Localism Act 2011 and the Wellbeing Act, it actually says in that act. 2011, that local authorities should engage with community groups. They encourage you, them to engage, which means that you can have an influence on the town planning, on everything, on education, schooling, medical facilities. And I was asked by the Conservative MP there, why did I form the London No Community Care Association? I said, because the Conservatives were in power. They brought this legislation out to say we can do that. So I'm doing that. Mm. And the well-being act actually says if it's damaging businesses, then the, the, the local council have an obligation to try and mitigate any financial damage to the businesses. So what they do, uh, business rates have been reduced by 75% around here in some cases. So if you've got the situation that they have, say, in London or some of these 15-minute cities where they're trying to restrict the number of vehicles coming in and going and, and, and individual businesses are saying, well, actually, hang on, this is... This is now damaging my income because whereas before it was fine and I was building my business, now you're effectively forcing people out of the town so I am no longer doing it. These associations can go back to the council and say, hold on a minute, you can't do this. Yes, and the council will say, um, what authority do you have? Are you, an, are you an unincorporated association? And then what you do, you go to the government website and get the definition of an unincorporated association. Aye, there's no contractual agreement between the individuals. It's just that the individuals share a common purpose. In this particular case here, we were worried about the utility bills being a factor of three, three and a half, because it affects all the hotels here. That's mm. what we survive on. So the integrity of the community depends on the work here and the, and the hotels being affordable. So as a community group, with those innocent words, community care, no one can knock you for a community care attitude. You can have some influence. Why? Because the 2011 Localism Act says you can. It says that they should, must encourage you to engage. So if you'd like to go on Facebook, other people on here, have a look at that. We have one set up down in, in Leeds. We have one set up uh, in North in Bangor. I have a meeting there on Monday to address people on this technique using legislation. Very, very clean legislation using the pen. And the pen mightier than the sword, as they say. 
and and peaceful as well. And and so it's it's interesting because I think a lot of people feel that there's pressure coming down from the government or from their employees, but the legislation has, has as you've explained, been cleverly and shall we say honestly th- thought out to help people if only they know where to look. Yes, and it does work, uh, Richard. When I use this. Um, what happened, The most of London now is owned by uh, a family going back over 100 years. Um, and my MP actually, his secretary said, oh, by the way, after you did this, there's a special meeting going on in a hotel down the road. I said, what's the meeting about? It's about the high cost of utility bills. How can we mitigate them? So that, it does have an influence, a, a community group. You know, mm. and on my community group, I've got all the directors of all the big businesses. So it's the first thing I did. I went to all the hotels, met the directors. I gave them a list of things. I've made a leaflet. Do you agree with this? You know, the hotels closed, no work for janitors, no work for housekeepers, everything, even for students at weekend. And it affects the integrity of the population. So they signed up to that. When I say signed up, there was no money involved. And that's that's very key. Uh, there should be no money involved. You should be, shouldn't be expecting any fruitive reward for this. Otherwise, it won't work. Right. Because people will accuse you, oh, you're in this for money. No, yes. I'm not. <clears throat> yeah. And it works if you don't do it. If you do it for other people, that's what the Jesus' second commandment, network, <laughs> to put it very simply. Network, everything will be okay. Well, this has been a fascinating conversation. I wasn't quite sure at the beginning where we were going to go with this. And I think you've you've shown um, insight that a lot of people will be quite surprised that the legislation works for them. We often feel, uh, especially in recent times, that a lot of these acts and statutes and things are actually working against people. But, uh, and, I, and I know a lot of the, the sovereignty people who work um, within the legislation to find those rules that have been set up and perhaps have been forgotten or ignored by a number of the policy makers but actually are there to protect people so i really appreciate you going into into the detail and and as you said stripping away the emotion and the narrative and just dealing strictly with the the bare bones as it were to get yes. to the point so yeah the really... last thing i should say to you then richard mm. is people a mantra because uh, I found this is common throughout industry. An employee will be approached by a manager and they don't know what to say. So this is the mantra of what to say. Just say, please put that in an email for me. Right. Why? You can understand. You can use it as evidence. Yes. And, and also it will control them. You're giving them an order. Yes. Once it's in writing, yes. as you say, you've got the evidence. What a, a brilliant piece of advice. So um, I hope that people uh, have got a lot out of this i know i'm for, i mean i'm self employed so um i i don't have some of those issues but i've worked with many people who who are under pressure from the the hierarchy of the system and the policy of these companies and and all of that so i'm i'm sure a lot of people what you've been saying will resonate deeply with them um if they want to find out more about you and the harmony website um i've got it uh, i've lost it now it's on it's on it so here we go um let's go the harmony union if i put it up on the full screen it does help of course um and let's go back to the front page it is harmonyunion.org i'll put the link in the description and yes. uh, people can find out more information about the work that you do and uh, they can join up as well is that correct yes we uh, have a legal cafe page on there and that's for a zoom meeting every tuesday at eight o'clock um it's three pounds to join our zoom meeting but we we tackle with the issues that affect everybody at work and and people they, people can put their questions to you and and yes. so on how brilliant is that Dr. Warren Lee, thank you so much for spending uh, the time with me. It's been uh, extremely worthwhile and it's it's an area that I've not tackled before. So I've been fascinated by it and uh, more power to you. You're doing excellent work. Thank you for your support very, very much. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's absolutely my pleasure. Um, ladies and gentlemen, there you go. I hope you found that fascinating. Do go and check out uh, the harmonyunion.org website, link on the description, and uh, see what they can do. Get involved, offer some help if you've got help or if you need help. 
um, then go along to the legal cafe. I will be back with more interviews and monologues and what have you. But in the meantime, from Dr. Warren Lee and myself, big thank you, uh, Dr. Warren. Absolutely brilliant. Until next time, from us both, goodbye.